Hello, everyone, and welcome back. We are starting a little bit early today, only about four hours, uh, because we're not doing a reading of our favorite creationist book today. No, sorry, we are instead chatting with someone. We are chatting with someone who goes by Age of Rocks on Twitter. Welcome. John, how are you doing? Good to be here. Thank you. Um, yeah, doing well. Fantastic. Um, so uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, please, for those of us who have not uh, seen you around before. Well, if you, uh, let's see. I got my bachelor's in geology, so went into the master's program, got a master's degree in uh, stratigraphy, sedimentology, and sedimentary geochemistry, basically, and uh, decided to apply that to more recent paleoclimate change. So I learned how to study carbonate samples that form closer to the surface of the earth in recent times and figure out uh, how the climate's been changing over the last few hundred thousand years. All right. So uh, what I'm hearing is you've already, you've been bought out by big science about the, <laughs> the whole global early. warming hoax. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, you should see the size of the stipends we get in grad school. <laughs> right. Incredible. I mean, how can you turn it down? So, yeah, but uh, so I, I finished my PhD working on um, paleoclimatology, and, and now I'm a postdoctoral researcher, and I'm also a visiting lecturer uh, nice. here and there. So it's it's fun, though. Get to travel, get to experience on uh, all the different laboratories and understand the processes and work with a lot of people around the world. So I'm on the road now and I'll apologize in advance. I hope that the internet here seems stable and good. Uh, Don't say that out loud. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but if I disappear, I'll be back uh, soon, I think. Okay, fantastic. Um, and you do a lot of like field work. You, you get out there and get your hands dirty in the rocks and stuff, right? I've been a few places, yeah. And... Uh, I mean, yeah, if you're curious, I've, I've been, most of my field work the last few years has been throughout Russia and a few adjacent territories looking at uh, cave samples. So we we'll go there and explore the caves hmm. scale. I, I don't work in any of the really deep caves, fortunately, uh, those can be, <laughs> scary, <laughs> but, um, but we do study those as well. And so there's a wealth of information out there and, um, been, I've been traveling quite a bit now to uh, collect samples, and we've got years of putting all the pieces together and hoping to make sense of it. Fantastic. Um, so last like 100,000 years, so you're predominantly in the Pleistocene and Holocene with your research. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, I think um, the interesting thing about working in more recent geological past, you can see things with at much higher resolution. Hmm. The Far, you know, the further back you go in time, the broader scale portrait you have to paint about um, about climate in particular, but really anything. Mm. Uh, you're just looking at a, a blurry image in comparison. So I think it could be fun, um, especially working with the geochronology, uh, because you know, if you're working in the Paleozoic, you you get a radiometric dates and they've got air bars of over a million years. And right. that's pretty good. You know, it's it's still under one percent precision, but plus or minus a million years. And and here I've sure. seen air bars like plus or minus one year. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's, that can be exciting. I mean, it opens up a lot of uh, uh, different kinds of questions when you can see Earth history mm -hmm. at that kind of resolution. Um, so that's what I like about it. Absolutely. And we will get into some of that, uh, sort of stuff, um, in a little bit. I just want to mention for a moment. Um, so, uh, actually in the most recent video that I did, which I published <laughs> middle of last night, uh, was the I eyes tale. So predominantly about the lemurs of Madagascar. Uh, the I is one of the ugliest little creatures I've ever seen. Sorry for any I fans out there, but, um, 
the the animals, all the animals on Madagascar rafted there within the past like 60 million years, but they did it within a time frame when Madagascar was farther south because the the um, the currents moved in, uh, I guess, from west to east. But then as Madagascar sort of shifted upward, the currents go in the opposite direction. So nothing from Africa could go across. And so I thought it was really neat how you have this, the, uh, the genetics and the fossils, which point to this one conclusion, which is then also uh, supported by the tectonic plate movement and also the, even the paleoclimatology. And they're all painting the same picture. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, you can see that it's closer to home, perhaps, too. Just looking at, um, say, the closing of what's now the Panamanian Isthmus, mm -hmm. right? That wasn't yeah. always there. The Atlantic Pacific were connected at one point, And when they got disconnected by this land bridge there you know, from the tectonic evolution in North and South America, uh, that diverted that current, which now is the Gulf Stream that makes, you know, Scandinavia quite tempered, given the high latitude it's at. And so it completely changed mm -hmm. the uh, landscape of the Northern Hemisphere. In fact, that's when the ice sheets began growing, because suddenly that current fed a lot of heat and moisture to high latitudes, which meant it could accumulate snow at a sufficient rate to make uh, giant ice sheets over Eurasia. So like, uh, it, it's incredible how intricate these stories can be and, and corroboratory. Mm -hmm. uh, and you find these clues that sometimes you don't even expect it. You go, you're looking for a completely different question. You find samples that, uh, you know, back up a story that was you know, proposed quite some time ago in a completely different place. So, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and that's, that's something um, that I think a lot of people who are, uh, well, creationists really, who don't seem to understand about evolution and deep time is that when, biologists and geologists and physicists whoever propose these scenarios for how these things change it has to be it, or it can't be contradictory to anything we already know right it has to take all the evidence that we already have and then add on top of that something which isn't also contradictory are right? you saying so, things should be internally consistent oh uh, maybe that's a possibility it's nice to have at least uh, you know okay that's, that's sometimes good. anyways <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah like uh, to your point about that with the uh, because you have the you can do the the radiometric dating right of like when the isthmus formed you can look at the geology and all that sort of stuff and we can also look at the fauna the fossil fauna because it's not until three to five million years ago something like that when we start getting south american animals moving into central and then north america and mm -hmm. we also have, um, so we have them moving. Oh, and also on both sides of the of the the isthmus, we see the closest. We see sister species of each other, basically, like mm -hmm. the um, the mantis shrimps and the uh, urchins and um, what uh, pork fish and all these things, which are sister species, but they're on opposite sides of a land bridge, right? So how does that happen? Well, it must have been that there was one continuous population here which then got split and now they're on opposite sides and so yeah every part of this is internally consistent mm -hmm. um there's a video it, oh go ahead no i was just going to say like from paleontology perspective it's also fascinating because you get this uh if you're studying late cenozoic paleontology of the americas mm -hmm. um north and south america look they, they already have their unique uh, fauna, but they look mm -hmm. even more different prior to 5 million years ago. And you get what's called the Great American Faunal Interchange, right? Which is mm -hmm. a terrible name for it, because really it's about as much of an interchange as like the uh, colonization of... <laughs> right, <laughs> it basically. Uh, it didn't go well for South America, basically. <laughs> so, you know, but the fact that you can um, you can describe this, and in, in even before we had constraints on the dates, I mean, it's recognized within the paleontological record that something's happening here. Species mm -hmm. move from here to here, and you can make hypotheses about, like, what what should be the age, for example, of um, the Panamanian Isthmus and right. the deposits there that made that land bridge. Uh, and, we, you know, we corroborate those quite well with the, the radiometric dating. And, and so it's it's always entertaining to watch people try to 
be dismissive of the various lines of evidence, but including geochronology, which is yes. sound. Um, uh, somewhat, you know, one of the things that you're familiar with is the uh, like the heat problem that creationists like to throw out there, where mm -hmm. you know the they have the continents moving at like rapid speed to mm -hmm. sort of a, attempt to account for things that we have you know extremely good evidence for. We have extremely good evidence that the continents move and that they formed in particular ways. You know, for especially for the more recent continents, like it gets harder when you go back to like Penosha and those other really really distant uh supercontinents but especially for the more recent ones it's like they must have been formed in this way and even the creationists nowadays acknowledge that so they have to fit this in but on a really short time scale yeah and when they try to move one thing it knocks over something else and then when they try to fix that thing it knocks over something else and then so on and so on and so they keep like kind of compounding problems all together yeah or if, if you're familiar enough with all the data it's more like if... 300 something else is right <laughs> right uh, i mean even this uh, this idea that's this divergence of the i mean the continents on either side of the uh, north atlantic or of mm -hmm. the atlantic sorry uh that th this could have been a rapid process is pretty asinine um <laughs> if you simply study like the petrography and petrology of the uh, atlantic seafloor and even the topography like all you need is high quality sonar to, to see that this didn't happen rapidly. And, and I think one of the more fascinating um, aspects of that seafloor is, uh, with that mid-ocean ridge is that it thickens and thins as you move out in, in, in a cyclic fashion. Um, and this is related to the rise and fall of sea level on glacial interglacial cycles over mm -hmm. the quaternary and, and actually even more distant past, right? So <laughs> in other words, you have ocean floor forming when there's more water and then when there's less water then there's more water and less water <laughs> like you you want to say that the the ocean right. went up by 100 meters and then back down and then up and then back down well it was the flood it just this? kept like, you know uh, undulating you know by a lot yeah the because you know <laughs> there's enough time there for <laughs> the pressure response to equilibrate like a new sea floor right level. yeah i mean it's yeah, it's it's totally ridiculous. Um, I tweeted, I think, just yesterday that um, in terms of the scientific response to like creationism and intelligent design, these things are on equal footing with flat earth and anti-vax. Like intellectually, they're all the same plane. There's no there's no difference between them. Uh, mm -hmm. It's only pretense on their side that thinks there's any ground at all. Um, but at any rate. Uh, so, so I brought you here because you are, you know, you do geochemistry and all that fun stuff. So, uh, very simple question, which I probably, uh, is an entire lecture in one of your classes, but, uh, do we know that, uh, radiometric dating is accurate? Can we be, um, relatively sure that it works, you know, within reason, I suppose? Yeah. I mean, uh... The short answer is yes, but I, I think it's okay if anybody out there wants to take a skeptical view and say, well, you know, I'm not I'm not sure how this works or I'm not sure that it works mm -hmm. and I want to approach it, you know, cautiously. And that, that's fine. Let's let's be extra skeptical here and um, also be honest about the fact that uh, radiometric dating is uh, it's, first of all, a physical model. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and we can use physical models, for example, to. Uh, project the path of a falling object from the sky, right? It's, it, we, it's, it can be a quite a simple physical model, like you could do it in middle and high school physics, right? Uh, looking at how things accelerate toward the ground. But mm -hmm. if you get into the real world, you find that uh, Earth's a bit more complicated than that. And dropping objects from the sky, you got to deal with things like uh, fluid dynamics and friction from the air drag and, and such that it's actually very difficult to model, right? And, and you might have instances where your model just doesn't match reality. And that is the case with radiometric dating. I mean, you have a, a system that is, you know, ostensibly, it's just a, a crystal with a given chemistry, but in, re, in the range of geological histories, you might have crystals uh, that deform, that fracture, that are exposed to hot fluids or acidic fluids or, metal rich fluids and, and things like this. So you're, you can get so many scenarios where 
reality doesn't match the model. And if it doesn't, then the uh, model age of things that you get doesn't match what the actual age is. So let's mm -hmm. uh, like at least clarify that um, that's what we're dealing with. It, it's, it's like plotting out uh, missile trajectories and having to deal with the complexities of Earth's atmosphere. And it's not so simple. And sometimes you're just going to get the target wrong, right? The path is going to be wrong. But the more you do it, the better you get at it. And the more you uh, find ways to double check your homework and, and make sure that the model actually does match reality. And so that, I think that's what's, um, mm. what, what's, uh, what makes radiometric data so, work so well uh, are the numerous ways by which we can check and double check the assumptions that go into the model uh, when, when we use this to try and describe um, a geological history of a given mineral or something like that. Uh, so, you know, we'll all learn about the various assumptions that go into radiometric dating, like uh, that the decay rate is known and constant through time, that uh, it's isotopically a closed system, and that we know, uh, you know, the starting amounts of parent or daughter product or ratio between the two, or, you know, we have some constraints on that uh, before we can begin to model out how this changes over time. Uh, and, and the best way to do that is to work with various isotopic systems. So if you have two different isotopes decaying at different rates, right? So each can be used as a clock and, and you use those to check because they should give you the same time, right? And if they're not, then that tells you something's up with the system uh, where this, this model doesn't match reality. And, um, you know, you can check the, uh, if you want to check the assumption that this remained a closed system, you can look at the, uh, the raw geochemistry and analyze, like on the micro or nanometer scale, uh, subtle changes in the concentration of trace elements that would tell you, was this mineral altered by fluids in the past? I mean, if you go back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, when we're developing and trying to date the whole geologic column, that, you know, developing the methods and, and get all these boundaries dated so we know how old the you know how, how old is the permian for example uh uh back then i mean you you're working with much larger samples very coarse resolution and higher air bars uh because you don't have you know the high-tech vacuums and lasers and amplifiers and uh, high sensitivity detectors that we do have now um and, and you know, I, I think um, anybody who's not working in the field might not appreciate just how advanced some of the technology is compared to even 20 years ago, mm -hmm. let alone 50 years ago, to the point where you don't just date uh, a rock, you know, even date a mineral. You could take a mineral that is less than a millimeter wide and get ages all the way across the mineral from the center to the edge. And things like this can help you mm -hmm. Um, feel more confident that geochemically the system worked the way the model describes. And when you get to that point, you can be extremely confident in, um, in most ages because mm -hmm. we can check and double check and corroborate and, and so forth so that we know the age we have really does, ha um, you know, has some sort of time significant or time element to it that explains the chemistry we have now. Um, another good example of that is, um, let's, if we're looking at systems where we know that things get younger with time, for example, in a sedimentary succession, you can't have layers forming on top of each other. I mean, the, the bottom layer has to be there before the second mm. layer forms and then the third layer. And so, and then this goes 500 years back, we've known this. Um, so when you're dating things back through time, and I've, I've got a few papers on hand where they're dating ash layers throughout the Jurassic sequence. Uh, a marine sequence, you know, you've got like ammonites here and, and such, but then you got a thin layer of bentonite clay and a radiometric age of the volcanic material there. And then a few layers down another age. And so when you see those increasing systematically in such a way that gives you an estimated depositional rate, like it, it, you can estimate that those sediments were um, accumulating at so many centimeters per thousand years. And that is about the same as the observed rate of sedimentation in those environments today, mm. like it's really hard to dismiss that and say, no, that doesn't work. There are assumptions that go into this. Like the, the very fact that ages get older when physically the only possible reality is that they do get older in time. Like you, you got to admit that there's the time is at least one variable that's explaining 
those differences in ages. And, and the samples I work with mainly come from caves and, and we look at stalagmites and you know that they grow from the bottom up. So the age should get older as you go from the top down to the bottom. And those age models are, I mean, some are just incredible, like to the point where you, you, you got ages that are five years plus or minus 0.2 years. Like, yeah. you know, and then it gets progressively older. Um, and I, I have samples, for example, where I dated almost, you know, every millimeter and even dating every millimeter uh, so that the layers are only getting older by 20 or 30 years, I can still see that systematic increase in the age. Like if, if this doesn't work, then somebody's playing a really bad trick on us. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and these are systems, again, where you can check it through multiple isotopic systems. Uh, you can look at it through the microscope, check the uh, form of the, and the shape of the crystals, to protections, uh, some sort of contamination here. And so is, every time we have an example of, you know, age has gone wrong, it just doesn't work. And there are cases where the model doesn't work. Just, I mean, that's that's just the reality with the complex physical systems. Uh, there are a thousand examples where it works really well. So I, I'm sorry, that's a long winded answer. Um, but like, no, said, that's great. It could be a lecture in itself. Uh, and right. I'm sure it is for some of your classes. That's what I was saying at the beginning. I was like, you know, I'm almost sorry for for, you know, batting you this question, because I'm sure you have a whole lecture that's just the answer or maybe multiple lectures. It's just the answer to that question, mm -hmm. you know, like. Um, I've, I've been in stuff where they're like, you know, oh, can you explain evolution? Where it's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <I'm> the... <laughs> you know, um, you, you mentioned, so, because you've been on, on R and Raw's show a couple of times. And one of the things that was really fascinating to me that you mentioned, um, was dating historical things. And you mentioned it just now, where you're like with your error bars, like plus or minus a year, something like that. Uh, can you explain that like a little bit, how we can use radiometric dating to date like historical uh, events? Uh, sure. Uh, and, and I would say this wasn't something within our grasp last century for the most, until the very end of the last century, uh, with the exception of like the radiocarbon system. And, and I think most people would be broadly familiar with how the radiocarbon system works and how mm. we date things using that. Uh, and of course, that uh, is most accurate in you know, stuff that's like less than 20,000 years old. Right? Um, and so that's geologically very recent. But, but dating things that are only 20,000 years old with the conventional systems is not something we could do with the technology um, until quite recently. Um, but, you know, going into the late 90s, uh, they began to try this more and, and see like, well, can we do it reliably? Uh, can we replicate these studies? And, and so they did, they started, they uh, actually as early as the 1960s started dating historical volcanic deposits, mm -hmm. meaning like they, we know when this volcano erupted, it was recorded in history within the last 100, 200 years. Um, and they did get ages that were within uncertainty of a hundred years old, um, but the air bars are plus or minus thousands of years. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's a good sign. It tells you it's working, mm -hmm. but um, it's not super precise. But toward the end of the 1990s, um, we have ages for the Mount Vesuvius eruption that uh, have air bars, you know, that are less than plus or minus 100 years. Uh, and right on top of the known historical age of that eruption. And you could say, hey, maybe that was a fluke, except that, you know, sure, they, it wasn't just a single... Uh, test, right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of work went into getting that age, but it was replicated, not just with that method, but which was the argon Arth argon method, but also with the uranium thorium helium uh, method using different minerals system, you know, so we've got multiple isotopic clocks, mm -hmm. uh, geochronometers, and giving the same age using different minerals within the same volcanic flow. And these happen to be all the same age, uh, the known age of that eruption, which is about 1900 years. Uh, so that's um, a good way, not only to tell you that like it works, but that we've reached this um, point where we have ultra high sensitivity and good precision, even in things that are quite young. That's useful because um, we have a lot of volcanic flows that are less than 100,000 years old. 
or at least less than 2 million years old that help us understand um, things like human evolution and pinning down migration of human groups across the world mm. uh, also helps us understand uh, things like uh, ocean cores or we get better dates for the ocean cores because we can drill those you know very deep uh, back through the sediments that cover several millions of years or even tens of millions of years in some of those uh, so the better you can date those ash layers the you know better it is um, but there are other methods uh, like the ones that I work with and, and comparable ones such as uh, uranium thorium and I think um, a thorium protactinium method uh, it, it kind of work the same way in and to put it really simply uh, usually when we explain radiometric dating you might think like a bucket full of water and you poke a hole in it and it starts draining into an empty bucket so you've got okay. a parent element that decays into a daughter element and the lower the bucket gets this where it drains out and then this one begins to fill up quickly at first and then more slowly mm. right okay so you got exponential decay exponential accumulation and the ratio between these buckets can tell you at any given time like how long they've been draining out if you know the decay rate right right um and these other systems work much the same way if as long as you can imagine that you poke a hole in the bottom bucket as well uh, because you have a, you know, radioactive uranium decaying into thorium, which is also radioactive, and that decays into radium and so forth. Okay. Uh, so it's mathematically, it's a lot more complex, but yeah. that's actually good because it gives you multiple ways to check the system and identify when, again, the model doesn't match reality. Uh, but it also allows you to date things that are quite young, um, less than yeah, the, the maximum window for using this method is about 700,000 years. Anything older than that, we don't think with it. Anything as young as zero years old, you can date with it quite precisely um, to the point where we can use this dating method to improve on the ice core chronologies. And keep in mind, the ice core chronologies are built by counting the number of layers of ice back through time. Um, wow. And those, <laughs> those, of course, have intrinsic uh, uncertainties. Right. You might have layers that are missing or duplicated or just mm -hmm. not recognizable boundaries or something. So it's it's not like every single layer is perfect, you know, all 30,000 sure. or more that you can see. Uh, but we can use that to double check. And, and that's another way that we know that both of these systems are working well because uh, they they can give you the same age for the same event. Very clear perturbations to the system, like what's the what's called the Younger Dryas event from uh, 12,000 years ago, this big cooling episode at the end of uh, the last glacial period. Mm. Uh, um, we knew we recognized this very clearly in the Greenland ice core, but now recognize it in other um, climate records that are dated by radiocarbon or uranium thorium and so forth uh, and have much smaller air bars and give exactly the same age. I mean, how can that happen? Uh, you know, what, what would happen? What would change about radioactive decay that would also affect to, proportionately the same amount how fast ice layers accumulate in Greenland or how fast tree rings grow right. in Scandinavia. Like, do you see what I mean? Right. And that was that was actually another thing I was going to bring up was the was the fact that it's it's not just like carbon dating is not the only thing, it's not the only way to date very young things, because like, you mentioned ice cores and also tree rings of uh, dendrochronology. And these overlap, right? So you have like these, you have this tree over here, which uh, you can count back this far and you have another one which kind of overlaps with that and all that sort of stuff. Um, I was reading a paper about um, these like sub fossils in uh, Canada. I believe it was, they were looking at diet, there's like freshwater diatoms and how there was a bloom in them. So you get all these, uh, their, their cysts or whatever when the Canadians got or the Europeans got there and were doing agriculture. And so this there's this runoff from their fields, which was causing a big bloom in these diatoms. And so that was another way you could like independently date when these things were there or, you know, when these people were here because they were causing this effect, which, mm. you know, you can carbon date and all that sort of stuff. So, um, are there any factors that you're aware of that like uh, affect the decay of isotopes are there any that we're like aware of 
uh, they can affect like the stability of the nucleus and how quickly it'll decay. Right. So like it, like you were talking earlier about making the like assumption of, of, you know, this steady decay rate. So is that, uh, you know, there are circumstances in which, um, that assumption has to be, um, like reevaluated. Uh, no, not in not when you're looking at geological systems. Okay, you know, especially near surface systems, but even you know mantle systems. Uh, there's nothing in the environment that affects that. Mm. Uh, under very extreme circumstances, like in plasma phase, uh, and and we don't have plasma <laughs> phase that's really on Earth, so it's not relevant again right. to geology. But uh, sure, for sure, in um, some cases, in plasma phase ultra high temperatures uh certain decay modes can slightly change but not not to the point where it would actually undermine uh the geochronology right that, that we have so in systems they're not analogous to earth because they can't exist in our system sure uh, i mean the only other factor could be like uh, changes in the uh, fundamental forces like that uh, mm -hmm. we can from nuclear forces that would bind the nucleus together. I mean, sure, right. yeah. If you if you could hypothetically change those uh, forces, then yeah, that would affect the stability of nuclei and the rate at which they decay. But simultaneously, that should also make uh, nuclear uh, nuclei that are now stable become unstable, mm. right? And we don't see any evidence of that through history. I mean that. Like if there were a reason to believe that suddenly, you know, stable carbon atoms were decaying wildly and going through nuclear fission or, or something like mm -hmm. that, then sure, uh, we might want to reevaluate uh, whether or not this decay has been stable. But that would be um, because the fundamental forces of nature have decayed or changed. Right. Uh, not only is there no reason to think that there's no positive evidence for it, there's, you know, million lines of evidence against it. Um, every time we analyze the geochemistry of these um, uh, minerals that you know record <laughs> something that, that happened on Earth history, regardless of when you think it happened, like uh, ag again, these systems can be used to check each other, mm -hmm. and they regularly corroborate. And that is, I mean, gosh, 20, 30 years ago, you could publish a good paper using uh, just a few dates and one method, and and now, if you want to make your case, like you got, you got to back it up, and everything has got to be multi-proxy, multi-method, if you can, mm -hmm. uh, you know. And we don't accept, um, you know, if if you want to argue about like when is the exact age of the end Cretaceous extinction, well, you can't do that with a couple of dates. I mean, you got to right. corroborate that a thousand times, and then we can talk, you know, <laughs> like. So, so at that point, this is just a, a million data points that would contradict the idea that there's been any change, um, any measurable change in decay rate. And uh, it's interesting. Um, the in Cretaceous extinction is a, a date that has sort of slightly changed. Like as we've gotten as the the number of dates on this one specific uh, point, like from around the world, uh, have all gotten better and better the timing has gotten more and more precise. Like for a long time, it was like 65 million years ago. Now it's like 66 point something, something, something million years ago, mm -hmm. which is, is just amazing. <laughs> yeah. And, th and that's okay. Uh, and there are a few reasons for that. And one could be uh, where are you measuring that boundary? Um, right. What kind of material you're are you measuring? Mm -hmm. What kind of uncertainty do we have on those ages? The other thing is just knowing the decay rate. Uh, and I think often we don't appreciate just how how difficult it might be to measure the rate of decay in some of the, especially the really slowly decaying elements like 40 potassium, right? Mm -hmm. Or uh, the 238 uranium and so forth. Um, but knowing those precisely, I mean, that's something, an ongoing process we're you know constantly right. coming up with ways to measure that more precisely and so sometimes that decay rate that you look up in the textbook that you use in your formula to calculate the age of the mineral that will change over time but you know in the same way that say the estimated distance to the moon would change over time mm -hmm. right today we can measure right. it a lot more precisely than in right. newton's day 
but it doesn't mean, I mean, his, his estimate was pretty darn good, right? Sure. Uh, you know, but just because that number gets more precise doesn't mean that uh, things change fundamentally about how we understand, uh, say, the structure of the solar system. And that, yeah. the same with uh, the geochronology, like the, the refining of those ages often it results from those two factors, getting more data and from better sites, from better minerals, using better techniques with better instrumentation and also having better decay rates. So you plug in the right factor in your formula because just changing that by a few decimal points will change the age slightly, you know, mm -hmm. by a fraction of percent, but you know, at 65 million years, that's, that's a little okay. bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The, uh, there was a, there was a big argument for a long time in like geochronology circles about where the Cambrian should start because mm -hmm. thinking was, you know, was it, 600 million years ago was it 700 million years ago and then as you get closer as you get more and more recent then and the uh radiometric methods uh become better and better and we find like index fossils and now we've settled on like 541 million years ago as our mm -hmm. as our particular point just because the the way as you're saying the way to measure has just gotten better just increasingly better over time yeah and it's also keep in mind it's not like a football field and somebody's asking you measure the distance to the goal line um you don't know where the goal line is like you're also mm -hmm. as a community defining where to put that goal line and right. it's your measurements may or may not fall exactly on that line they could be above and below it and you're interpolating between where's the best fit for the line where are we going to define it to be you know um right because so process oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I was going to say um, you may have heard about the, uh, the 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 start age for the cryogenian period got moved uh, recently. Not because the actual, not because they changed any dates, but they changed the start of it to coincide with the uh, the actual glaciation event for which the cryogenian is named, which I think makes a lot more sense. So now it's uh, seven hundred and twenty to six hundred and thirty-five million years ago which mm -hmm. makes a lot more sense to where it was previously because it was like the beginning kind of preceded the glaciation events for which the cryo and is named. So it's like, that didn't really make any sense to kind of move that back, which I, I appreciate. Um, oh, okay. So um, another one you've probably heard, I think actually you discussed this one, was uh, what about, I I'm sure you've heard about like creationists like Snelling and others who get these like ridiculous anomalous dates for uh, for like rocks and things. What do you, what's typically your response to mm -hmm. people who bring that up to you? They're like, oh, they dated, uh, was it Mount, Mount St. Helens, wasn't it? The yeah. eruption. They're like, aha, we got a date that was, you know, 10,000 years ago or whatever, which is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, I, yeah, I've looked at all those. Uh, mm -hmm. in detail and if and if anybody comes across that and not sure what to make of it first thing is um you got to look very carefully at the geochemical data and do it yourself and if you can't do it yourself that's fine because uh it's probably not something that you train to do but if you can't then find somebody who can and does that routinely mm -hmm. uh to double check it and the answer is always different because i've seen them uh, do this for, I don't know, Neoproterozoic ages in the Grand Canyon and also of stuff that's really young, like Mount St. Helens. And mm -hmm. the reason for those discrepancies is always um, different. But there have been times, too, when I've taken his data and, and he'll, like, write this paper in an answers research journal or something <laughs> and, and say how, like, oh, we have this date and look, there's uh, no relevant age data here and they're all over the place and they're older than they should be. And I, I took it. It's like, but you you basically reported, uh, you know, what would be an isochron age and you didn't actually ever plot it as such. You didn't make the classic isochron plot, which is how you would get the age from this. And uh, then I would plot it myself and find that they fell on a line and gave an isochron age that was basically zero. And he spent an entire paper talking about how they got these dates and they're all older than zero. And so obviously this doesn't work. They're anomalous. And it's like, but your data show that the age is zero. If only you would have plotted the way that any geochemist 
who measured those uh, those isotopes would plot it. So why didn't you do that? You know, and uh, besides that, then they'll they'll report ages from uh, Mount St. Helens flow, but without you know by missing the context. Uh, for example, regarding the uh, detailed petrography of the minerals to to look at the texture, they it's not like they used a machine that could measure core to rim variability, meaning like from the center of the mineral where it's least likely to be altered versus the outer rim of the mineral where it's most likely to be mm. altered if okay. it was. I mean, you want to look from core to rim to see if there are vari variations and what could be causing right. that because that would... Um, that would upset the model assumptions. It would um, violate the model assumptions. But they didn't report anything like that that we would use to check the uh, veracity of ages. Um, you know, but if you look, there's always something that sticks out that's obvious. It wouldn't be obvious to anybody who didn't take like a, a radiogenic isotope class or, or work with these kind of data regularly. Right. Uh, but that's the that's the advantage they have. They can like work on the presumption that you're not going to check their homework and anybody who will check their homework doesn't matter because we're not trying to convince them of anything. I mean, they're, right. not they're not writing those papers to persuade me that there's something fishy about the dating methods or the samples. Like it's, it's pretty obvious to me that there's, there's nothing going on here uh, or nothing out of the ordinary. He just didn't finish the story. Yeah. But he's not writing that paper for me. He's writing it for people who've never studied geology before. Sure, uh, and that's yeah, that's that's um, the that's a major problem with modern like creationism and intelligent design is there's been a a selective pressure from you know sort of the general public for them to make their work look more sciency, right? For it to go from just being blog posts because anybody can make a blog post that's you know who cares mm -hmm. but aha it's in a journal now well yes the answer is research journal okay well you know aha we got it put in the journal of theoretical biology now aha now we've got you we've got a real scientific paper here mm -hmm. you know it's go ahead. i like how you describe it as selective pressure though that's <laughs> as as though the um the pseudoscience movement is itself is evolving here. I think it is. Well, uh, you know, I say that, and yet this book is from 1967 and it has the exact same arguments that you see today, mm -hmm. um, word for word. So <laughs> there's a, a selective pressure for presentation, not necessarily for argumentation, I guess I should say. No, but I, I agree. Um, and the goal for them is to give the illusion of, uh, how would I say it? authority it, i guess yeah but you want to give it a, a facade so that when people mm. look at it uh it looks you know like a fancy research institute and you imagine that on the inside it works like one too uh even mm -hmm. though it doesn't um <laughs> <laughs> you know but, but the movement itself has evolved uh, yes most definitely since well, let's go back to the 60s when you have real tangible start to the creation science movement, which kind of grew out of a, a sub demographic of the ASA. So you have this, if you don't know, American scientific affiliation, which was a group of predominantly Christian scientists who are sci scientists and engineers and other professionals who had a group like, you know, let's, let's uh, uh, use our faith productively in our professions and, and to build society. And that, that was fine. But like within that group, there were just a few people who would try to convince the rest of the group that like we should make this become like the creation science movement and let's reinterpret all of geology and biology to support the biblical timeline and they, they looked and like what do you mean the biblical timeline that's that, there's that's not what it is like that's not just that's not how we should be reading the book and, mm -hmm. and uh, applying this like that it's, it's not a guidebook for what we can and can't find in reality and nature right um mm -hmm. so the but that's kind of how it got off the ground. It like worked from within there. And at first it was built to persuade other professionals, other scientists, other engineers who were also in the church. And they mm -hmm. moved from there to 
and they kind of gave up, I think, uh, stopped trying to persuade them and went to the general public and said, like, yes. look, if you don't follow us and believe that, uh, yes, all the evidence is in our favor, then you're just you're not in a real church. You're in a compromised church. You're in something else. And they, and they created mm -hmm. this identity movement where they broke away from what they could now call the mainstream. And anytime you say that's mainstream, of course, it's got this you know, negative connotation to it. You don't want to be mm -hmm. a part of the mainstream, right? You're not a sheep. <laughs> so a cool uh, yeah, it, it, but it worked. It, it worked really well um, to a point, you know, and, but then they need to give it this, uh, you know, rebuild it with a more scientific appearance. Uh, Cause I think people kind of caught on to the fact that this is, this is not um, science and, and they haven't, I mean, they've had decades to find something that uh, would actually corroborate their story. And yeah. we've got only the opposite. Uh, and that's what does put it on par with, with something like a flat earth movement that can grow really fast if you get the right exposure and find the right medium. Yeah. But Yeah. Uh, the, um, the, and certainly the, the presentation changed as you're saying really in, into the nineties, because once, People caught on, and we we actually had in my own state, Louisiana, a couple of different cases that were about creationism and how it, it is uh, definitely religion and not science, uh, like Freiler versus Tenjipahoa and uh, Edwards v. Aguiar and these other cases. But then that just made them sort of go underground, basically. They had to change how they presented the material, which is what intelligent design grew out of, right? The intelligent design movement was literally a, you know, find the word creationism and replace it with intelligent design and then rebrand it as, oh, no, we're not affiliated with any sort of theology. This is this is all science. We're, we're just we just care about the science. None of that religion stuff, mm -hmm. which it doesn't help that, you know, the major ID organization, the Discovery Institute also puts out articles on politics and religion but you know regardless about <laughs> that stuff um but but yeah it, it's they tried certainly they tried at first to pretend like it was just science and now they've kind of gone back to it's the culture war mm -hmm. you know so we've kind of come full circle i guess <laughs> which yeah i mean it's it's fair enough to formulate your hypotheses from this and you say like for whatever reason if, if you believe you know this this event say this particular family lived mm -hmm. in this part of the world at this particular time and um modern populations grew from that to me it's okay it doesn't matter where you got the idea you can still pose that as a hypothesis mm -hmm. as long right. as you test it like any other hypothesis and um but it, it's become you know the undying <laughs> immortal hypothesis i mean there's there's no way around it. it doesn't matter how many times and ways you falsify it it can't it can't go away right it's always going to come back in different form and so if it didn't work yeah. in that one well let's rebrand it and try again but um you know it's it's unfortunate because like uh from my perspective it's very easy to see uh how unscientific the approach is and and i've kind of given up as on um treating it as such and, and my idea was to like well let's let's just take all their claims and treat them as hypotheses and and forget the the religious mm -hmm. overtones or anything else because you know that very easily divides people in trying to discuss this uh but let's just set that aside for a second and and you claim x happened at, in the past at y years ago then let's let's find the tools to test it and do it and right. um it i think it turns out it's a, it's a fun way to teach geology just as um i don't know exploring flat earth claims could be a fun way to teach physics <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it, it, but really, it, you learn a lot about geology by just taking um sure and article from aig and and go through uh what they're trying to tell and then just uh let's go pull the actual data out there because chances are they'll present you know a problem in geology we're not really sure what happened here we're not really sure what caused the end of the cretaceous fauna mm -hmm. uh let's you know in, in reality there are plenty of data to test this idea and they just ignored it all by not yeah. citing it and so you know we just go through and, and cite it and 
but it you know it's a good exercise so. you're you're right on that um and i mean i think that's why so many channels on youtube are um combating creations and like taking a video and then breaking it down piece by piece and showing how each of the arguments is like comprehensively wrong is is fractally wrong it's just wrong within wrong um mm -hmm. and and yeah you you really do learn a lot of stuff um you know when um john sanford says you know, like uh, organisms are degrading their populations are degrading over time well you have to go into the literature and and then he'll cite like some articles in the in the you know normal, mainstream normal literature then you go read those and you're like huh you know how is he getting that from from this and so you have to go and then read the the actual the technical literature the primary literature and suddenly you have like a more comprehensive knowledge on these subjects than they do even though they were the ones making these arguments originally i mean that's how i learned about sodium cycling in the oceans which i never would have taken the time to study but you know then there was a andrew snelling paper about uh how the oceans are getting saltier and this puts an upper limit on the oceans of you know tens of millions of years not several billion <laughs> mm -hmm. and and i like i wanted to check his math and also his citations but a lot of the citations are from books and written published in the 1970s and 80s only available in hardback on that part of the library where nobody goes so i went there and i tracked <laughs> them all down and uh double checked all the numbers and it was pretty enlightening just um how badly they no it's just like where they would take a number and ignore the rest of the paragraph that says this is why this number would have been half of what it is 50 years ago that it is today I think mm. that that's a, you, know, you know so i found that all of them are, are wrong and and all the fluxes that they cited were wrong and um when you just go back to the same sources they used and and put the real numbers in there then actually it worked there is no upper limit to the age of the oceans based on sodium cycling or any other element for that <laughs> matter um yeah but it, it's fun you know tracking down the sources and yeah absolutely you always learn fun stuff it's really fun when you find a claim where the data they're citing just doesn't exist um so i don't know if you've read uh the rocks were there by rj downard and myself but one of the uh one of the things that we found was we were tracking down a claim by this guy named Ariel Roth. And so Roth was claiming that a coral reef, um, this coral reef could have formed within the last like 2000 years because the, the growth rate of the coral was such and such. And he gave this like ridiculously high number for coral growth compared. And like we, we compared it first with, because I think we had a hard time finding the paper at first because it was from like the 1920s or something like that. But we eventually mm -hmm. did find it, but we compared that with other known growth rates for coral. And we're like, okay, this doesn't match up at all with like anything we can find, but we did manage to find the paper and the number he cited just didn't exist at all. <laughs> just wasn't in the paper. And that's fun. <laughs> wow. I think I could get a lot more published if I took that approach. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Probably, but you have to publish in the journal of like theoretical biology. I don't, you know, the journal of um, we we found three random reviewers who are too drunk to really take a care of the <laughs> paper. Um, not, I mean, why didn't they just cut the coral open and determine the growth rate that way? I, or I think I I can't remember what um. I can't remember how they were um, determining it or whatever, but it was just, it was like the number he he had chosen just wasn't in the paper at all, which is what we thought was so funny because I found it. And then I said, RJ, will you look this over and make sure I didn't just miss it? And he looked it over and was like, no, it's just not in there. This number does not exist, you know? And which, which is amazing. That's the best kind of thing when you find stuff like that, like, you're not just wrong. You're fractally wrong. You just made it up. <laughs> Source, just trust me, bro. <laughs> you know, and another common error I've seen and uh, related to dating things is mm. 
a common motif um, in their approaches is to take a phenomenon like the growth of coral reefs or the mm. growth of um, caves or sedimentation in the ocean and the idea that you can just find a growth rate, a depositional rate anywhere mm -hmm. and say like, if it's big enough that it could explain this much growth in less than 4,000 years, then we're golden. That means we've explained this. Like the, that's not the question here. It's not a question of like how fast things could happen theoretically under certain circumstances, right. but how fast did they happen for this particular sample? Mm -hmm. Um, in, and I'm astonished to see like just how many presentations and including by people with masters and PhDs mm -hmm. uh, being interviewed on certain channels coming on and saying like, uh, like, here's how we know all this could have formed within such and such time. I found a citation that says like that these minerals grow within caves uh, or actually not within a cave under a bridge this fast every year. And, and therefore we can explain the growth of all these other cave formations in right. a few thousand years. It's like, but the rate isn't the same for every sample, not even every cave. Yeah. Not even within the same sample. That rate can vary by an order of magnitude within the same sample in the same cave in the same room. And right. for coral reefs, it's it's a similar situation. They don't grow at a constant rate. We never thought that they did. Yep. Uh, and there are multiple ways that you can constrain this by looking at uh how fast they grow um, by making analogs or in laboratory conditions or by, uh, you know, analyzing annual banding, seasonal banding or other observations. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we even have like time lapse photography of these minerals growing. So we know how fast uh, they grow and they're all different, you know, but um, it, yeah, it's the idea that you can just uh, document some sort of rate anywhere in nature and apply it to all the rest of it. Mm. They left it. You know, we found a case where a tsunami laid down a meter of mud within X number of seconds. Therefore one meter times this many seconds. Oh yeah, that's shorter than one year. So sure. We can explain 5,000 meters of mud deposition, uh, less than a year. <laughs> it's like, come on, you gotta, like, that's not even close to resembling scientific method. Um, yeah, but I think there's genuinely clueless on that fact, that point that it's not how you would approach it. It's not how you test a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. uh, it's maybe how you could generate a hypothesis to test. Mm -hmm. Like, look, we found a place where coral reefs can grow this fast. So we're going to hypothesize that it that was the case for this reef. Okay, well, go test it. Like, fine. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen anyone try to carry that out. Um, yeah, and and I I keep mentioning caves because that's what I work with all the mm -hmm. time, right? But I've seen so many presentations from people coming on, like, "Look, we built this cave maker in my backyard, and, and we grew a stalactite within a, a month." Okay, so <laughs> how, yeah, how fast do you think they grow in caves? Like, it's completely different chemistry, different atmosphere, different environment. Like everything is different. Um, there's no single rate at which any of these happen. So test your hypothesis, come up with a method to test the age of that. Um, and, yeah. you know, that's, that's why we use some, you know, radiometric dating in tandem with uh, other methods, including like isotopic chronologies, uh, just looking at uh, variability of stable isotopes and trace elements, uh, radiogenic isotopes, even uh, thing, anything that can, tell you how the environments and the hydrology and the climates and the ecology on top on the surface was changing with time you know? yeah um oh darn i've lost it um yeah there was an i got it the there was an article actually put forth by um andrew snelling which he compared he said oil can form rapidly uh and he was referring to like biogenic oil and he was saying it can form rapidly because in a lab, these researchers made some abiogenic oil. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, they admitted, you know, in the article that he's citing, this has nothing to do with natural conditions for biogenic, biogenically formed oil. These are not at all the same. 
in like yeah. any way, shape, or form. And he's like, no, no, but look, they made avogenic oil. It's fine, guys. Come on. Yeah, but take that to the next step and let's like let's test it. You know, yeah. so th- this oil was made in the lab in X number of hours at this rate. Mm-hmm. So what's different about that oil that you made in the lab and right. the stuff that you find in nature? I mean, for one, they don't all have they don't have all the same chemicals in. And mm-hmm. they that's because they were formed at different temperatures and rates. And the other thing, this was formed at temperatures that don't happen in the upper, like in the crust. They don't exist in the crust outside of, you know, volcanic intrusions. Right. Uh, so how is that relevant? Like, of course, if you turn up the heat, you can cook something faster. That doesn't mean it was cooked faster. It doesn't mean you can't tell the difference between like a, a, a rib roast that was cooked for eight hours on a smoker or something versus <laughs> one that you threw in the, the oven at a thousand degrees <laughs> in a couple of minutes. Like you can tell the difference between those and we right. can tell the difference between oil that formed rapidly and oil that didn't, you know, or oil that formed at high temperature versus low temperature or, uh, you know, sediments that lithified at high temperature versus ones that lithified at low temperature. Like there are proxies for all of these processes million different ways we can try to piece this together and the puzzle's already there it's like put together and um that i guess that's how i see it sometimes you know we've got this jigsaw million piece jigsaw puzzle working on a few more pieces and they're sitting over there and they found two pieces that fit together and they're exclaiming that it's it's a picture uh, of a beach I mean, look at these two pieces. They fit together, and this right. is definitely a beach. And you're like, but here, look, we've got a million pieces already put together, and that's not a beach, you know? Right. Uh, but they won't look at the picture. And, yeah. And start to keep fiddling with their two pieces and publishing papers on how they fit together so well. <laughs> like, um, it, it's sad in a way. Um, and, I, and I feel bad because I, I know what it's like to like be caught up in that mindset. And be convinced that you're the only one who figured out how all mm-hmm. of this works. Um, when right. in reality, you just, you know, you're judging a book that you haven't read. Yeah. I, and I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I did say just about an hour and I think we're, we're just at about the hour mark. I do want to ask one more question. Um, I'm sure you've heard the claim that like, uh, well, we carbon dated, you know, like a seal, or a marine snail that died like yesterday and it's given us dates of a thousand years. How do you yeah. typically respond to that? It should, it should give a date. Um, it's, especially if you're looking at tissues that form from a uh, seawater uptake or, or bicarbonate uptake from the seawater, because all carbon within the water has a resident, a reservoir age, a, an average time that those molecules have existed in the ocean, right? They're first taken up from the atmosphere, they dissolve into the ocean, but currents move them around. And especially mm-hmm. if you go to places like Antarctica, that carbon has been, you know, it, it actually sank down in the Arctic and it traveled all the way along the bottom of the Ar- uh, the bottom of the Atlantic uh, and finally made its way and bubbled up to the top of uh, the ocean again. Mm-hmm. And it's been there for a thousand years or more. And so the age of the carbon that things like seals and mollusks and uh, other calcifying organisms, marine organisms, whether mammals or not, uh, the age of that carbon is or could be 500 years, 1,000 years, 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's good. It's good that it dates older than zero years. Otherwise, we'd have a problem. We knew that something's wrong with the method. But the fact that those give ages of non-zero, that's... um, that's a good sign. It's just like if you date something that's uh, 60 years old, radiocarbon dates something that's 60 years old, it should give you an age of like minus 5,000 because, okay. because of the nuclear bomb testing in the 60s that, that pretty much doubled the, uh, oh. the atmosphere. So <laughs> relative to our standard atmospheric value, um, this should have a negative model age it's from the future right uh and okay. ostensibly you could say like well i mean radiocarbon dating doesn't work but no we should expect that to be the case and this makes for a useful tool by the way you can radiocarbon date things like groundwater 
Mm -hmm. um, if you if you find stuff with excess 14C in it, you know it's got to be from like the late 50s or the 60s or early 70s when there was that large spike in 14C production from the testing of nuclear bombs. Right. Interesting. Okay. Uh, it, it, not only uh, 14C, but there are a few other nuclides like uh, tritium, which is three helium, or, sorry, three hydrogen, um, a, a rare isotope that um, was produced by bomb testing. And we monitored around the world. I mean, that's one way that we knew that, uh, you know, when and where these bombs were being set off is, was their atmospheric signature. And that stuff got carried in precipitation. So you couldn't completely hide that you were testing nuclear bombs. Anyways, we, we can use that for dating. And, and it's, a, it's a great tool, dating groundwater in particular, looking for those spikes. So yeah, there um, you got to understand how the carbon cycle works before you start radiocarbon dating things and mm. you're claiming that there's an anomaly here. Yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you. Um, is there anything you would like to add before we go? Unrelated, Switzerland <laughs> has the coolest coins. I've, like, look at the size of this thing. <laughs> it's double the size of a quarter. And, and this is like five Swiss francs right here. Um, I probably won't be able to use it because <laughs> I can only use it. It's, it's actually, I'm sorry, this is totally off topic, but uh, you can buy things with euros here. But the change they will give you is in Swiss francs. So you got to be, um, you got to plan ahead. Otherwise, you end up with a bunch of extra money that you can't spend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's true. I, I, yeah, I've not had that problem yet. That, so. you? <laughs> I've not yet had that problem. Oh. But maybe one well, day. It's I not the be... worst problem to have, but um, these, I was surprised by the size of this thing. It's like, this is amazing. I, I, I feel like I'm in a, I don't know. I'm collecting treasure here. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're having a good time. Yeah. Um, you got a lot of other fun places you're going to be headed this year? <laughs> well, um, going back to this really exotic country, uh, the United States. Oh, <laughs> no. That's, um, that's a rough man. Yeah, it's going to be a bit of culture shock, but I think I'll get through it. <laughs> Oof, we don't have time to get, we don't have time to unpack all of that today. <laughs> we'll be here that's for another right. hour. Um, but it, I really appreciate uh, you having me on. If you got any more questions, I'm happy to try and answer them, or we can look at more detail um, at, at some of those Exam I mean, if you've got a claim, hey, we dated this thing and it came out wrong, then let's take a look at why. Uh, I think actually we, we learn a lot more um, from those so-called anomalous results. And in particular mm -hmm. with radiocarbon dating, uh, most radiocarbon dating that we do is not to learn how old something is. Yeah. Rather, it's to understand the carbon cycle at that time. We use another method to find out how old it is you know, by like counting tree rings or using a uh, uranium and thorium. And then we radiocarbon date it and look at how wrong that age is to learn something about the carbon cycle at that time. Right. Uh, Interesting. Okay. For example, uh, if you want to know how much of the carbon came from a, a dead carbon source like bedrock and how much of it came from the atmosphere, how much of it came from soil or microbes or things like that, then uh, we can use radiocarbon dating to, you know, look at surface systems, ecology. It's a, you know, endless yeah. <laughs> string of questions. Uh, and, and so, you know, geochronology, we got pretty creative with it, I think in the last number of decades. Gotten creative. Well. We've, we've got good at figuring out how old stuff is, but we're, we can't just be satisfied with that. Well, yeah, and I mean that that also um, informs. Uh, well, knowing how old some you know stuff is informs biology, right? Like with um, molecular clocks, mm -hmm. um, a lot of times you know, some node is based on how old a fossil is thought to be, and if that fossil changes by, you know, just something crazy like ten million years, 
then that's going to, you know, radically affect your other dating points in this in this tree, right? And so that's another place that uh, we need to be relatively, you know, sure of our dates so that we can also make these other trees, which then uh, have other effects because you, know, you compare the fossils with the molecular trees and how old they think, uh, you know, the rocks are and all that sort of stuff. And as we were talking about at the beginning, it's all uh, internally or it has to be internally consistent. Mm -hmm. These things all have to match up. If there's some contradiction somewhere, then yeah, it has to get a rethink, not necessarily be thrown out, but it has to get a rethink of how we are approaching, you know, at least one of our data sets in this. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, absolutely. And that's actually something that I'll be talking about later in, um, I'm doing the series called The Ancestor's Tale. Have you ever read the book The Ancestor's Tale by Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong? I am not sure that I finished it, but um, oh, at well, one point I, I read a couple of um, a, few, a few of those books. Well, we uh, we're doing uh, on my channel we're we're doing a series where we go backwards. We're looking at each of the tales, and so we are 15 episodes into it now. So we are fully one fourth of the way through <laughs> the book. I'll, I should check that out and then uh, finish the book. Right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you should definitely I'm watch the series. my memory because I'm a, I am feel terrible. I, I mean, I actually entered college hoping to get a degree in biology. And you I became actually a rock guy. Halfway through a biology major before I switched. I, and now my biology knowledge is embarrassingly out of date and limited. So it would be good practice for me to go back to those. Yeah, abs absolutely. I mean, hey, if you want like recommendations, because um, we have like uh, some of our mutual friends have recommended some very interesting looking geology texts, um, which I have on my Amazon wish list. But uh, glances at bookshelf and then Amazon wish list. Uh, I think I'm going to be at this for a long time. <laughs> and then I went out. I was on vacation. Peter, was that last week? No, that was the week before last. It was two weeks ago, wasn't it? Uh, week before last, yeah. Yeah, week before last. Um, and we went to this bookstore, and I bought more books. I have a problem. But actually, you know what happens on um, the Steve Brusat, by the way, in case anyone's not aware, Steve Brusat is a paleontologist. He's a British paleontologist. He mostly does dinosaur stuff. He has a he wrote a book, The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs, a, a few years ago. He actually just published the sequel, I guess, uh, which is um, The Rise and Reign of the Mammals, which just came out, I think, like a month or so ago. And um, so I look forward to reading that also because The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs was really good. Um, do you have any book recommendations? Anything? <laughs> Do I um no, but I I'm sorry, I got none. That's okay. Um so well I want to thank you again for uh for coming on. I think it's it's kind of late where you are now, huh? Uh, it's about midnight, yeah. Okay. okay. Not as time. not as bad as Peter. <laughs> uh usually because he we're usually doing our, our Thursday show where it's like the middle of the night for him. Um we're in the same time zone. So, we're in. Oh, you guys are in the same time zone. Okay. If if John's in Switzerland, yeah, he's in the same time zone as the yeah. Netherlands. Uh, oh. Yeah, I've been in Central European, I think. Well, okay. Well, yeah, that's right. Uh, because um, we yeah we moved this this show up so that it wouldn't be uber late for you. But uh, Peter does usually <laughs> do this in the middle of the night because he is a. Uh, we appreciate you, Peter. All comes, of us comes with the territory. This... I mean, I, I produce for you. I yeah. produce for Arn Ra, uh, people who are not not living next door to me. So yeah, it, it just happens. We sh we sh we should need, since we have someone here who's who knows a lot about rocks. We sh we should need to find a way to push America back towards Europe to to make that change a little smaller. <laughs> I mean. Right, we all get on the west coast and we start pushing, <laughs> yeah. pushing it back know. to Africa and annoy Hovind. Maybe we just dump 
all of our trash in the middle of the Atlantic, it'll reverse that spread into a convergence and it'll pull us back together. That's, it's, that's okay. We're, we're coming up with solutions here. There yeah. you go. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if the, the critters will like it, but I will. Um, we can, we can well, start, thank you we again, can start with, with, for... with a certain politician. That, that'll fill a big hole yes. to start with. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, mo- I would say most people, <laughs> but anyways. Um, well, thank you again for coming on, John. Uh, thank you for hosting, Peter. As always, You're this show runs on you. Um, and thank you, everybody, who was there in the side chat. Love thank all you of guys. you. And don't forget to like the video, because you guys aren't doing it. So do it now. Uh, alrighty. Well, we will see you guys next time. Actually, oh, tonight, uh, I'll be on Dapper's channel at 7 p.m. Central. What is that? Central Daylight Time or whatever. Uh, so in about three hours, I'll be on Dapper's channel. So go watch that if you're interested. So, all right. Bye, everybody.